This is a machine that could change our world in ways none of us have ever dreamed. Imagine if all our energy needs were totally free. It would mean the end of power bills. No more visits to the gas station. Fossil fuels will become redundant overnight. And pollution would be a thing of the past. The poorer countries could rid themselves from the ravages of famine, and deserts could be turned into oases. And here it is. A machine running without fuel, made for the future. A future that could alter the entire social, economic, and political balance of our planet. All over the world, there are individual inventors, scientists, and techno-mystics who are dedicated to this obsessive quest. And having come together via the internet, they now meet in small groups and talking in a techno-language few of us would understand. They have just one aim in mind, to bring us free energy. We are going to have to go back to the basics, <coughs> stuff that we have forgotten. Anything go... greater than 100% is over unity. The unit produced like one and a half times more thermal energy than Canadian it took to drive. technology drive. that claims that it gives, it, it's, a, it's a device, like a transformer with a circuit, with you know, capacitors, inductors, I coils, whatever. the most whatever. promising technology that we'll see soon, I, I have to think that's going to involve uh, magnetism. The magnetics, yeah, it stands a real good place, but the one that can be in place first is the hydrogen. The world the in a period of months, the world will change. Conventional scientists refer to believers in free energy as crackpots, conmen, or kooks because they work outside the current laws of physics and they believe there are a number of free energy alternatives to fossil fuels and nuclear power, including anti gravity as a power source, turning magnetic force into usable electricity. Collecting energy from the sky. Free energy motors that can recharge their own batteries. Self-driven electromagnetic engines with enough power to put spacecraft into orbit. And of course, traditional perpetual motion machines that power themselves. Is it important? Of course it's important. Not only would free energy change our world, but it would also be the end of the fractious economy of oil. And of course, governments are afraid of it and societies are afraid of it because suddenly there'll be an equalization of power. I mean, when suddenly the power companies uh, no longer can charge you monthly bills, you know, and then oil companies, yeah, there's a lot of negative stuff and I'm probably dead just from saying this, <laughs> but... A lot of people think like that, and they think it's possible that we can make these little devices that will let you produce energy. You become totally free. Aldo Coster lives in a small village just outside Paris. He's a retired car mechanic who, for the past 50 years, has been obsessed with a single idea, to design the ultimate perpetual motion machine. A peu près 70. 70. Voilà. Recently, his story was picked up by French journalist and author Jean-Pierre Lantin. And one day, he got his first ID by working on a crashed car, and that was about 50 years ago, and he had his dream that in his mind would be, uh, would make him the equal of Faraday, Marconi, Edison, or Einstein. As a single-handed project, this giant wheel is an extraordinary achievement in itself. Standing five stories high and weighing more than 20 tons, Aldo Costa claims it'll run forever under its own power with no fuel and that it'll generate enough free energy to light up a small town. Flying in the face of conventional science, such a project inevitably attracts the skeptics, such as this man.
amateur thespian, full-time engineer and part-time scoutmaster, the self-appointed policeman of the free energy movement, Eric Krieg. For the past seven years, I've had a prize offer of $10,000 out for proof of free energy, which may or may not be a perpetual motion machine. I've talked to many people from around the world who believe that they will soon get my prize, but as yet, no one has showed up to take the test. Aldo Costa would have some difficulty in transporting his wheel from France to America, but with the help of Jean-Pierre, he sent Eric an email claiming the $10,000. Dear Monsieur Eric, I have constructed a perpetual motion wheel that will run forever with no fuel. Please, I would like to claim your $10,000 prize. Signed, Aldo Costa. There have been some complex working devices. They've been called perpetual motion machines by the inventors themselves. As for Aldo Costa of France, I don't know too much about him. There is not much on the internet. He is a relatively new contender for the perpetual motion prize. But you simply can't get energy out of nothing. Eric Krieg has history on his side. Over the centuries, there have been literally thousands of perpetual motion designs, none of which have ever worked, and it has driven many a good man to despair, fraud, madness, and suicide. What is important to understand about Aldo's work, if one wheel is not enough to generate much power, but if the system works, if hundreds of wheels in series could be constructed, it should be enough to generate power to the whole world. To understand the extraordinary claims Aldo Costa was making, here is a classic perpetual motion design, and there appears no reason why it shouldn't work. The weight of the falling balls turns the main wheel, which in turn raises the elevator that brings the balls back up to the top for reuse. At the same time, the wheel operates this generator, and we have a fuelless machine that will run forever, supplying us with free energy. Yeah, not quite. Unfortunately, the weight of the balls on the elevator, plus the friction of the various moving parts, together with the extra power needed to turn the generator, all add up to greater than the energy provided by the weight of the falling balls. So, fulfilling the current laws of physics, this machine wouldn't achieve a single turn of the wheel, let alone run forever. Now, as soon as you say, if perhaps the angle of the elevator could be a little less steep, and maybe the ball's a bit bigger, then you're in deep trouble. You are in danger of becoming obsessed by perpetual motion and spending the rest of your life divorced from your spouse and married to a machine. As Aldo Costa would tell you, obsession is a hard taskmaster. But at last, after half a century, he claims he has overcome all the pitfalls of perpetual motion. And if he has, this machine is a real threat to those individuals, companies and countries whose fortunes have been underpinned by gas, oil and coal, plus perhaps others who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. So far, uh, since the machine is finished, Aldo has had visits from uh, physicians from a lot of countries, actually, from Italy, from Canada, from Russia, and uh, also some now some eminent French uh, scientists, some of them members of the Science Academy, uh, to uh, establish if it's really what we can call uh, perpetual motion or not. One of my most popular web pages is my history of perpetual motion machines and free energy devices, which unfortunately reads like a litany of fraud, often committed by once sincere inventors that simply can't accept the prospect of failure. One such inventor was Charles Redheffer. Here at the Franklin Institute, we have this wonderful Isaiah Lukens model of Charles Redheffer's perpetual motion machine, and it seems to have worked or didn't work by utilizing these inclines and weights and a very elaborate system of counterbalance. What the people saw was a device that apparently ran under its own power. But a young engineer by the name of Coleman Sellers thought he smelled a rat. Coleman Sellers realized that the larger wheel was actually 
pushing the power wheel. Uh, and he realized that by looking very closely at the cogs and saw that they were wearing out in the opposite direction. This model clearly shows that the machine was actually driven by a clockwork motor hidden underneath the machine. And that an attendant would actually wind the clockwork motor by pretending that he was dusting it on a regular basis. Charles Redheffer had been charging the enormous sum for the day of five dollars each for people to view his magic machine. So now, in fear of an angry mob, Redheffer hoofed it out of Philadelphia only to try his scam again in New York, this time exchanging the clockwork motor for a servant turning a handle in the room next door. Today, the prize for inventing a free energy system that could power the world is, of course, enormous. Way back in 1946, an inventor by the name of John Searle claimed he had designed a technology that used magnetics to produce unlimited free energy, and that he could use this technology to power a flying machine that could carry 2,000 people from London to New York in under half an hour. It is built very simple. Round here is the actual drive part, which is, by the way, uh, all electric magnetic system. Uh, beneath, you will have eight legs on the actual craft, and combine all, it will take 2,000 passengers. It will be economic to run because there's no fuel bill. Why do you think people don't believe it? I don't know, believe the motor car was coming, or the train, or the aircraft. So why should they believe about this? John Searle persevered in trying to persuade others of his dream, and finally the media did begin to take him seriously. The only person that has ever developed this technology is Professor John Searle. He did this from 1946 through 1978, I think the last one was done, and is capable of redoing it again. This thing wanted to fly. So to me then, the easiest thing was to work on a body. Let me fly. People say, well, you can't do this. You're going to upset the entire world economy. The whole economy is based on oil. We have, uh, and it works, they're saying. Well, it works very well for the people who are running the economy, uh, but not necessarily for everyone else. And particularly not, it seems, for John Searle, who, according to some, was never going to be allowed to let his invention see the light of day. I come from an ex-Secret Service background, where I was in electronic intelligence. John befriended a, um, a f quite a well-known figure in the States, uh, a CIA informant. And it's only shortly after that, uh, when John got back to the uh, UK, that things went horribly wrong for him. And they uh, attempted to say that John was um, illegally accessing power from the national grid and imprisoned him for some six months. Uh, two things have to happen. We have to give away free energy technology and we have to give away gravity control technology. That's the only way that that stuff's going to get out because there are so many other interests that want to keep it quiet. And that's why you hear all these spook stories about people and, you know, families are threatened. The per it's not just threatening the person, it's threatening their family and all their friends. And that's what scares the heck out of people. And they say, well, we'll shut up. They'll try to find some legal mechanism of closing it down. If you're an idiot and go and try and patent it, you've given them all the inroads on where you are, how to contact you, etc. So be ultra aware of that. And be careful of getting a bullet in the head. John Searle must be good at dodging bullets because today, age 72, he has managed to keep himself and his dream alive. This meeting in London is with Harold Asperden, who has an honours degree in engineering from Cambridge University, and is also the retired head of IBM's European Patents Division. Before we pop off, that's life. It ran straight. Kept straight all the time, up and down this Dressed in his uniform as Commodore President and Chief Pilot of his new airline, John Searle explains the basics of his free energy technology. What we, we have here is an idea I started with that kept my mind ticking. It would. This is a basic design of the model we want to build, a flying machine. Uh, this is the 
structure, basic structure idea of how to go about assembling this right. concept. The power unit to drive this machine is basically the same as a domestic power unit that we want to develop, drive cars, but it, the engine is a bit more complicated. But that power unit is basic in itself? Yes, basic. It, it applies to anything. And any it, can, it can run, give more power than the power you're putting in, is oh, that right? Yes. yes. When I first heard of this, I realized that you had something new that was different from anything before, in that you have those magnets interacting with one main central magnet yes. unit. The thing I see in it is that the magnets rotate, and if they can cause the ether to rotate as yeah. well, the resulting rotation is in the same direction as the, as the magnet, it therefore will accelerate. The government knows about this work. Nobody's hit them hard about this work. The government, the government only know what their advisors tell them. <laughs> yeah. Their advisors get money from the government, yes. and they want to keep getting the grants. So yes. they're not getting the advice they should get on matters like this. Anyone inventing this would be wealthy beyond belief and would instantly earn themselves a place in history. And that is why I believe that so many people persist in chasing this impossible dream. So is John Searle simply one of Eric Krieg's deluded inventors who cannot give up on an unworkable idea? The big money from, big from the money, Americans yes. in particular is essential. Clearly, Harold Aspiden doesn't think so, and yet it has taken John Searle over 50 years to get someone with Aspiden's qualifications to take him seriously. It started on its own. Was this also to be the fate of people like Aldo Costa and other free energy inventors? Is it art? Yeah, of course it's art. If this isn't art, what is art? I worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory for 34 years, exploring energy production from conventional nuclear sources. And as you know, Los Alamos National Laboratory developed the first atomic bomb that was used on Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan. New ideas frequently come from outside of conventional science. I mean, I myself, uh, being a conventional scientist, look at things objectively look at things in terms of the rules and it's more difficult to think outside of that. Uh, the people who do that generally are people who are very unusual. On Keelinet we get roughly 600 hits a day and we get a lot of emails from people all around the world that a lot of, a lot of ideas, a lot of claims. There is something uh, uniquely beautiful about the, the idea of perpetual motion and the people who pursue it, and uh, some of the ideas that Keelinet has been promoting for years uh, as a central clearinghouse for something like 15 years now. Uh, we study perpetual motion, alternative science, and uh, different aspects of what's called unorthodox science. Okay, this Doug Comson is an alternative and some would say unorthodox here. scientist. Doug designs over unity oh, motors, oh, that is, motors that put out more energy than it takes to run them, producing a perpetual flow of free energy. Let's see. <laughs> it's okay, go, go, go. Here. Oh. What we have here is a motor that can run continuously forever because you run it on one stack of batteries and you charge up another. So this is a combination motor generator. This is what I'm into now. You have a little motor right here. Now the way the motor works, it's a pulse motor. So what you're doing is you're um, turning it on, making this electromagnet have power so it pushes the magnet away. So what I'm doing here, if anybody wants to know the circuit, is I take the uh, battery, put it into the coil, and then be, just before it gets to ground, I put a switch on it, so it turns on and off. And here's the switch right here. It's a magnetic reed switch. It's a switch that's controlled by a magnet going by it. This flame that happens inside this reed switch has a lot of power to it. It should have as much power in there going in and just coming out, because every time that coil turns off, uh, every, all the energy contained in the coil comes kicking back. Now, you can take that energy that kicks back and put it into a second battery and charge up a second battery. 
So now, there's this flame here, and to make it vanish, conventional electric motor builders will just ground it out or something. But what you want to do is you want to put a full wave bridge rectifier. It's this component you can get at Radio Shack for $1.50. It changes AC into DC. Look at that baby go. Here's the battery being charged here. Watch the volts on it. See, look at this. 12.65 already. 12.66. See, it's going up. And it's going to go all the way up. It's going to go all the way up to 14 if you want. So a few days ago, I ran this motor for uh, 50 hours. And I rocked the batteries forth. I switched them back and forth about three or four times. And at the end, I still had like 12 point something volts. And I could have gone a lot longer. So what this is, is a, it's a motor. I call it an over-unity motor in that you don't... You're, you're using so much power and you're always charging up another thing. So you never, you always have a stack of batteries being charged when you run out of your batteries on the other side of the system. It's like the simplest thing in the world. And it's a motor, which means you can turn a generator with it. And now all the electricity the generator makes is free. Or you can turn a water pump with it or anything you want, or a car. You can stack these, you can make 12 on a shaft if you want. So that's, a, that's what I'm looking to have is like a commercial unit people could buy in a store, something like this. Uh, just something that runs on car batteries, charges car batteries, and you have excess power with a generator to, to do whatever you want with. So it's free energy. Because <laughs> you don't have to pay for it, it's, it's just happening, it's free. All machines require some sort of fuel to operate. For example, the internal combustion engine in your car requires gasoline to detonate inside a cylinder, pushing a piston down through a connecting rod to a crankcase through a transmission to your wheels. Conventional science tells us that perpetual motion machines that would make all their energy out of nothing are simply impossible. But next time you fill your tank, it might be worth remembering that your car only uses 30% of the energy contained in the gas. 70% is lost to friction and heat. According to Doug Conson, a scaled-up version of one of his motors would not only power your car at over 100% efficiency, it would be pollution-free and need no fuel whatsoever. Is this a dangerous machine? For the oil companies, maybe? Can I kill me for this? The trouble with free energy is that it easily develops into an obsession. If you um, get very close with one device, but it just doesn't work, well, you're ready to try another one and then another one. So um, it can take over your entire life, getting closer and closer and failing, and getting closer and closer and failing again. But you know that um, immense success is just around the corner. You could have a house up on a mountaintop, living by yourself. You got anti-gravity to fly you back into the city, generate all your electricity, make all your water directly from precipitation from the air, uh, clean, uh, take care of your waste products, generate all, all the power that you need, heating, air conditioning, cooking, everything from these little circuits. It's, it's, it's a world that people now, most people don't even think about, but, but we see it, it's like a utopia for us. The internet, working like the message drums of old, had begun beating out the news of Aldo's wheel around the world. The internet was hot with rumors that the great skeptic from America, Eric Krieg, had at last met his nemesis. And as long as the wheel keeps turning, the pressure on Eric Krieg will continue to mount. For every perpetual motion design, I see not just wishful thinking, but a misunderstanding of rules of science. These people don't understand the energy involved in simple reactions of combustion, light, magnets, wires, wheels, motion, and I see real science as hoping to set people straight and explain how these things really work. But the wheel keeps on turning. As a trained mechanic and self-taught mathematician, Aldo was fully aware of the laws of physics, but he claims to have broken through the battle against friction and gravity. 
He explained that the wheel was always heavier on one side than the other. On the end of the spokes, there are 256 movable weights. At the bottom of the wheel's arc, the green levers activate these individual mechanisms. Each weight in turn is pushed toward the center of the wheel, at the same time contracting the light springs inside the green plastic covers. Then, as the weights reach the top of the arc, a similar system is used to trip the springs, allowing the weights to be pushed back towards the perimeter of the wheel. Thus, the half of the wheel moving downwards is always heavier than the half moving upwards. And according to Aldo, the wheel must, therefore, turn forever. Perpetual motion is, of course, only one way of producing free energy. For centuries, magnetism has been a known but mysterious source of energy. Just imagine if we had a technology, once you buy the machine, you never have to pay for energy again. Think of the phenomenal changes we would make. We're going to take 25 watts and run a 7,500 pound machine that I have built that you see in front of you here. That should be totally impossible by all conventional te technology. This is it now. Joe Newman claims that this machine, using no more power than is used to light a bedside lamp, will convert magnetic power into usable electricity, multiplying input to output by many thousands of times. At the same time, he says, it will also recharge its own batteries, making it free energy. I want you to see it goes negative more than it stays positive. It means the battery is being charged by the system. It's going to change your world in a most positive way. We'll be able to totally redo the Earth again for our children and our grandchildren. And we will travel even into outer space by electromagnetic energy. We can set up a manufacturing plant in every country in the world and make every country in the world energy independent of every other country in the world. I've always said this technology will do more to bring world peace than all the kings and queens and politicians who've ever lived. Let's see what kind of power we have on this shaft right here. I'll try to choke this down. You saw me pushing 900 pounds, 14 reps. That's one and three quarters horsepower 14 times. I should easily be able to choke down 24 mere watt input power. I'll try that and see if I can do it. There you can see that no matter how hard I try, you can't overcome that input of 24 watts. <sighs> I'm sorry, but an inventor holding a shaft in his hands is hardly proper calibrated instrumentation. This demonstration is meaningless and har hardly the proper level of proof one would expect for such a claim. This machine is running from the gyroscopic particles coming from the atoms of this mass. Joe Newman has written a book in which he claims this form of energy, which requires converting magnetism into electricity, could supersede all others, including fossil fuels and nuclear power. From 1965 to 1975, I gave a unified mechanical field theory, mechanics explaining gravity, electricity, magnetism, inertia, wave and particle theory of light. None of those things ever had a mechanical explanation behind it. Not Einstein, not Faraday, not Tesla, not Edison. No one could explain one of them. I explained them all with the mechanical laws of a gyroscope. Joe was refused a patent on the basis that his machine simply didn't work, and that what he was claiming was a form of perpetual motion, which, of course, conventional science has always said was impossible. I was so certain that it worked when I applied for a patent, I didn't even build it. My patent attorney told me that nobody would believe me unless I built it. I built it, it worked exactly as the theory predicted. I have given my life for humanity, I stood against great odds, against the U.S. government, who has fought this tooth and nail, tried to keep it away from you. And many congressmen, 11 congressmen, introduced bills into Congress to issue this patent to see that it would be produced for hundreds of millions of people across the earth. And that's the quote from them, that there was a conspiracy by the U.S. Patent Office and named Thomas Penfield Jackson, who's an SOB, 
uh, who stopped, tried to stop this technology. Norman Wootton is another free energy inventor who has come up against the Patent Office of America. In December 1994, myself and Joel McLean presented to the world a device known as the MRA. The MRA produces more output energy than the energy necessary to drive the circuit. It has been independently tested and verified by six different agencies with the final output figures as being 256 times more energy out than energy input. This information was provided through the National Security Agency, who we strongly suspect at the 11th hour caused the patent to be denied at the patent office, rejected with no explanation as to the reason for rejection. It's hard to believe, you know, here we are surrounded by the clouds and the mountains and, you know, the sky, and we're surrounded in a sea of energy. Dan Davidson, who has degrees in both physics and mathematics, believes the pyramids of Egypt hold the secret to free energy, and he has written a book that describes how certain shapes attract energy from the atmosphere, with the pyramid shape being the most efficient. But he too claims to have been sidelined by the Patent Office of America. There's a thing known as a uh, classified patent system which hardly anybody knows about. And every time you apply for a patent, it goes through a screening by someone from the Department of Defense here in this country as well as other countries. And if this device has any kind of uh, defense associated in, uh, interest, they can classify the, uh, the information, the patent, and tell the inventor to go pound sand. Free energy, uh, the nature that we're talking about, would be a very disruptive technology, at least initially. It would put out of business many people who uh, make their living and make their profit from conventional energy sources. Sooner or later, though, the, the transition from the conventional to the free has to take place, simply because we're running out of conventional fuels. There is no argument from mainstream science that we are running out of gas, oil, and coal, the fossil fuels that have so polluted our Earth. However, the only alternative conventional science has thus far come up with is nuclear power with all its dangers and pollution consequences. And yet there are other sources of energy that while they may not be the complete solution, they must surely be worth investigating. Around the turn of the century, eminent British scientist Lord Kelvin said that radio has no future, heavier than air flying machines are impossible, and x-rays are a hoax. So much for conventional science. It turns out that all of the world's thunderstorms are charging the ionosphere. And if you put up an antenna maybe 30 feet, 50 feet tall, you can run this motor anywhere on the Earth. And it'll just run forever as long as there's thunderstorms somewhere. And we can simulate a thunderstorm with a Van de Graaff machine here. The, here's our artificial thundercloud. Puts out maybe 300,000 volts. So if I connect myself in the circuit, the motor runs. So here's free energy that could be used all over the world. Plug it into the sky. You could harness electrical energy from a cloud and run a small motor with it. But the problem is that a lightning strike occurring could fry the motor and possibly you with it. Maybe I am dreaming, but I can see it run. Why am I obsessed with these non-round wheels? Wobbly wheels that don't wobble. I can justify it and say, I'm, oh, I'm trying to do toy research, but that's not the real answer. It's just, I'm fascinated. We had a real neat experience with an uh, anti-gravity experiment. Uh, New Energy News uh, published an article about... One fascination common to many free energy devotees is anti-gravity as a source of free energy. 
You but the killer application right now is Professor Gerbenikov from Russia. Well, what Gerbenikov did was he mounted a huge number of these bug wings and built it into a small platform. And the, the platform, he actually flew around Russia on. Uh, here's, here's the little handlebars. He would, it was kind of like a motorcycle handlebars. And he would manipulate these handlebars. And this column was hollow. And it would manipulate the bug wings that were built down into the inside of this platform. And he claimed that he was flying around at uh, almost 1,000 miles an hour, up to 1,000 miles an hour with this particular platform. Gerbanikov has since died, and we found out that he destroyed the platform a number of years ago. His, uh, he felt that this technology would be misused uh, and probably add more problems to the environment. He's a very uh, strict environmentalist. He goes out and kills a hundred of these insects, rips off their covers, glues them to a board so they're all facing up. He drops a metal pin, the pin floats in the air over this, this board. He turns the board upside down, the board floats in the air, and now it's projecting down, so it's deflecting gravity. So he builds this levitating platform, and he said he used popsicle sticks, flat popsicle sticks, and he would take 10 of these shells and glue them to the top of each of these popsicle sticks, put them all together, put a shaft down in the middle, and when he turns the, the shaft, all these popsicle sticks open like a Japanese fan. And he has motorcycle hand grips, so when he turns one hand grip, it opens the two popsicle sticks in the front. When he turns the other hand grip, it opens the two in the back. When he opens them partially, he floats up off the ground. When he opens them all the way, he goes up to a thousand feet in the air. When he wants to go forward, he half closes the two in the front, so he tilts like a surfer. Grabenikov's flying bug machine may appear to some to be more science fiction than fact, but of course, sometimes fact can be a lot stranger than fiction. You see, there's a, there's a, um, a difficult choice to be made here. You don't want to have these energies introduced too rapidly. You want them to be introduced at a rate at which they can be accommodated as the conventional energies are phased out. And this is a, a very delicate dance, a dance that has to take place. Remember that material that they found down in Australia right. from that flying object that crashed? Yeah. I mean, that honeycomb matrix? Whether you talk about stuff from like the old Roswell crash to you name it, though they keep coming up with that same kind of structure. 25, 25 honeycombs per square inch, and that was the dimensions. So if you were to stimulate that electrostatically, you might be able to produce some kind of a coupling with the, the ether zero point energy to couple with gravity to cause levitation. New ideas are very frequently uh, generated by people who <clears throat> are very strange. and. It's very easy to reject their ideas just by virtue of their strange personalities. <laughs> Where is the bubble coming from? Maybe some people from the universe was coming here in the beginning. There is one man who claims to have been visited by aliens who apparently taught him all the secrets of anti-gravity, perpetual motion, and free energy. And so we are told, lest he forget anything, they planted a memory device in his head. I went to the doctor and he says, oh, he says, how the hell is that? Well, I says, it must be an implant. If you have an implant, you have to work According to that implant, the, those three beings are within me automatically. While I'm working, I don't think about my wife, I don't think about the house, I don't think about nothing except my work. David Hamill is a Canadian recluse. He is a brilliant carpenter and metal worker and is currently building his own free energy flying saucer on instructions, he says, from the aliens. Those three beings came from the planet Cladden, the other side of us. There's two, two planets. Earth, Cladden, and in between, what do you think is there in between? There's the ionosphere. You can't go to it unless you use granite. I wouldn't be surprised the little ship that took off from me is up there in pieces. <laughs> I took pictures of that and 
I only got six pictures that were good enough. Apparently, David Hamill's prototype had taken off on its own, and according to David, the Canadian Air Force are still looking for it. You can read everything in there. This is the floor with the stairway to go upstairs. <laughs> now. Colon therapy and an advertisement for Robinson's Jam seem to have somehow got mixed up with the design for David's flying saucer. And here, in the center of the Great Pyramid, so David says, is where Saddam Hussein hid from the Americans. That's where Saddam Hussein has hidden all this from. Experiments carried out recently in Finland showed that under certain conditions, spinning discs placed one on top of the other can create an anti-gravity field above them and so lift off from the ground. If anti-gravity can be made to work, the mechanism, the, the machinery for doing that would be a source of free energy. So sure, come on in. Inside here. Huh? Now, this cross carries negative and positive. You see it there, the magnet up above and the magnet here. Once placed on top of each other, David explains, the disks are kept apart by reverse magnetism using hundreds of these magnets, each one powerful enough to crush a finger. The magnets are slightly angled, causing the disks to spin. To start off with, you've got to start prior. Prior, when you, you, all these wings are installed, it's a little bamboo stick. You know, you go through your teeth with a toothpick, bamboo made. You just put it there and put the other wing on it at the right height. And then the other wing, the same thing, three more toothpicks, only three, three toothpicks, because it floats. This is going on top. It's all granite. Just think about it. It's supposed to be all granite. This encave in the granite. So the air passes. So if it is all granite, then the hole you got there is to breathe God's breath, just like you are breathing. Well, if it's breathing, the hole that's there goes up at the top of this. It's built upon a stone end. So is David Hamill simply an eccentric, suffering from delusions and dreaming impossible dreams? Maybe. But it is worth noting NASA are currently working on an anti-gravity flying disc that is not at all dissimilar from David Hamill's design. It's high time that they do recognize what I'm doing is the Lord's work and not foolishness. And if the TV cameras that are taking me in the picture. I hope they take my word for real, for real, not foolishness. 24, 25. I have the same feeling as I have when I'm looking in the fire. Something links me to the future. Ryder Fintrud is a Norwegian and lives in a small fishing village just outside Oslo. He is not a mechanic, engineer, nor scientist. He is an artist. Did I start to create art? What is art? But as well as being an extraordinarily prolific and creative artist and sculptor, Ryder is also a visionary and a mathematician. 
When I first start to think about the to motion machine, I thought about the wheel. This wheel is something else. The weight is on the top of the wheel. And from this position, you can start working. I think you have to do something else. You have to do something. And so I start with the pendulums. I look at the wheel and put strings on all over it. So it comes up. When I had a lot of hanging parts, it's come up. Amazing. It was the yin and yang system. And then it started to be so amazing. So I couldn't go to sleep. I had to stay awake and, and make this machine. What was the beginning? What was the meaning with the yin and yang? This is the mathematical symbol for the force, the free force. Ryder Finchwood works 18 hours a day, seven days a week, and his obsessive nature shows clearly in this self-portrait. Ryder genuinely believes that, scaled up, his perpetual motion machine could well form the foundation upon which a new egalitarian society could be built, with everyone receiving free energy. And in fear that there may be those who would wish to suppress such a possibility, he keeps his machine locked away in a vault in the basement of his gallery. But is it perpetual motion? The beauty of Ryder's machine is the harmonious relationship between the ball, the magnets, and the pendulums. The ball is attracted to the horseshoe magnets, but the swing of the pendulums ensures these are lowered just in time to allow the ball to pass. Then this small round magnet is momentarily attracted to the ball, which sets off a series of fulcrums and springs attached to the much heavier pendulum hidden within the main brass stem of the machine. This central pendulum is surrounded by powerful magnets that force it to bend this spring and so oscillate the track in such a way as to ensure it is at all times slightly lower just in front of the ball. These springs in the center of the track are there to give the three smaller pendulums an extra boost each time the ball passes over them, thus ensuring they do not lose any of their momentum. In order to generate electricity, the ball would have to have enough momentum to, say, hit the arm of a paddle wheel each time it passes. And once you have an axle that turns, you have the ability to generate electricity. But the importance of Ryder's machine cannot be overstated. Over the three days it was filmed, the ball maintained a constant speed measured to 1 25th of a second. There will therefore appear to be no reason why this machine should not continue to run forever. Perpetual motion. Something that for 300 years conventional science has said is impossible. A proposition we put to a senior university lecturer in physics. When I looked at this device, I was amazed by the ingenuity which had gone into this. If the ball is heavy, it's not going to get lifted off the track. And at the same time, if the rib magnet on the top, if that has a pivotal connection to the rest of the system so that it can easily move up and down, it will move down towards the ball. Normally, the efficiency of any device is about 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. This device may have an efficiency of the order of 80 and 90 percent. And I have even read some literature which says it has 99% efficiency. When you consider that the internal combustion engine is only 30% efficient, 99% is an extraordinary score. But only at 100% can this machine qualify as perpetual motion. At 101%, it can be said to produce surplus and therefore free energy. Where is the power coming from? I had scientists from all over the world looking at it, and they can't tell me where the power is coming from. The claim that this is going to run permanently 
or indefinitely doesn't seem to hold because the second law of thermodynamics tells us that this is not possible. The fellow from Norway sounds sincere enough, but I really don't think he can come out ahead with just magnets, wires, and wheels. But what of Aldo Costa and his claim for the $10,000 perpetual motion prize? Eric Krieg surprised everyone in his final response to Aldo Costa's challenge. Indeed, it appeared as though Mohammed really had come to the mountain. There must be something special about it more than a... Yeah, uh, and wheel. then uh, everybody, there's this... Everywhere, you have this little masses, which is two right. kilograms each. Wow, this thing is huge. see how this works. Not only, it seems, had Aldo done the maths, but with every nut, bolt, and rivet, he had backed his absolute belief that contrary to the current laws of physics, energy can be produced by a fuelless machine. He had, he believed, found the holy grail of science, perpetual motion. It was a nice view of the French countryside from high up in the air here. It is impressive that one old man built all of this himself. Eesh. Onze. Douze. Treize. Quatorze. Quinze. Seize. Dix-sept. Monsieur Eric, quand on l'arrête, la roue, on la tient, on la lâche, pourquoi elle repart So, when the wheel is stopped, why did the wheel start again Some friction is variable. There are other sources of power that can come in. The wind can make a slight amount of power. The sun hitting one side and not the other side can expand it a little bit and make it counterbalance that it might move. From my experience with science and engineering, I can't see how this would ever be a source for external energy. In fact, with all the different sources of friction on this, I don't believe it can be a perpetual motion machine. For him, he doesn't see where the puissance would come from. However, he sees a lot where the puissance would be dissipated by, notably, all the mechanisms of friction. According to all the explanations that you have given me, Mr. Eric, the objections are real. He thinks, really. But it's the opinion of a single man. And that stops there. That, said Aldo, is the opinion of just one man. And the wheel keeps on turning. Join us tonight for the latest in Aussie innovation with new ideas on how to convert a surfboard bag into a good night's sleep and safely move patients without lifting them. Join us for The New Inventors tonight at 8 on ABC One.